Um, I just wanted to express my impartial to Rabbi Fix and Mr. Train. Baruch Hashem, I have had this close of having two daughters who have been told to One is Baruch Hashem married, she went years ago, one is there this year. Um, and all I can tell you is, I think I have a lot of girls. We've been to quite a few seminaries. But there's something that really spoke to me about Torah Devorah, which is just that it's all about the girls. It's just about what's good for the girls. There's no agenda. They're not trying to push on hashkafa. It's just they want every girl to be the best that they can be, and they'll do anything for those girls. It's all heart, and it's like you feel like they're the parent. When your kid is away, they're actually there. They're, they're parenting your kid with so much love. And to me, that was unique. Not that every seminary is wonderful, but that was just something that I never saw before in any school. So for me, that, that was the biggest selling point, and I have so much at Sato because my girls have done so well. They thrive there, and they never ever want to leave. That's the only problem I have, is that I can get them back. But um, so on that note, I will introduce Mrs. Shrey, who is, what's, your, what's the title? Director of Students. Director of Students, and then she's awesome. She's also my daughter's other mother, <laughs> mother in Israel. So welcome, everybody. And, uh, <laughs> so, um, before we begin, I really want to thank Mrs. Weinberg whose hospitality is uh, surpassed only by her humility. Uh, but I don't just want to thank Mrs. Weinberg for opening her home and for the beautiful, beautiful uh, spread that we all got to enjoy. I really just want to uh, thank Mrs. Weinberg for sharing her beautiful daughters with us. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Weinberg's uh, daughters, three of them to be exact, uh, are all part of Tom Devorah, each in her own unique way. Her oldest, or her oldest of the Tom Devorah three, uh, Mrs. Pearl is a very beloved, popular teacher in the school. Um, her second daughter, Zahava, who I consider a very uh, dear, close friend of mine at this point, is assistant and by it. And her daughter, Dasi, is currently a Shana Aleph student and possibly Shana <laughs> <laughs> And uh, more than anything, really more than anything, sharing her daughter with us is, is her daughters with us is, is the biggest gift, the biggest gift possible. I want to tell you that when schools uh, make such events, similar events, generally they opt to do it in a restaurant or a hall. And Tony Bar has consistently over the years uh, chosen to make this event in a home. For the past few years it's been in the Weinberg's home and I think the reason we do that is because it's a reflection of our identity as a school. Tony Bar is a family. We feel incredibly close to one another and it's only fitting that such an event, the first time that we all meet each other as a group, should happen in a, in a home atmosphere, in a home environment. There's something very magical about this event. This is a thought that I have every single time I have the, the privilege of being part of it. And that is that whether you realize this or not, many of the uh, individuals in this room will end up lifelong friends. I know it's a, very, uh, it's a very difficult thought to process at such an early stage of the journey. But many of you will end up at each other's weddings, Many of you will end up being the, the confidant that you call in between dates. Many of you will inspire each other. Many of you will support each other. I mean, we have a few very uh, special alumni in this room. I'm pointing this way, but I feel like they're scattered all around. Special alumni in this room that I, I don't think, when they were sitting in these very chairs, could ever have imagined the impact of these relationships on their lives. Am I right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Someone here, I'm not pointing any fingers, but I'm joking. Someone here, one of you, told me just a few minutes ago that looking around the room, she feels uh, a, certain, a certain sense of nervousness. And I told her, wow, you're the only one. I'm joking. <laughs> I told her that nervousness is our indication that something of consequence is taking place. Right? Something of significance is about to happen. This is, in many ways, not to be cheesy, the first day of the rest of your life. This is, the, in many ways, the, the kind of beginning point of a journey that you have no idea where it's going to lead. So let's zoom out for a second, okay? Why are we here? Why are you here? 
So I'm sure it's not for the sushi or the uh, amazing entertainment, right? There's a deeper, more meaningful reason why each one of us found ourselves crossing paths at this stage of the journey, right? So coming here and on my many travels around, uh, around the world, really, and some of you I've gotten a, a chance to, to meet on those travels, there's a, a certain thought that I always have whenever I stand at an airport. And that is that airports all over the world have a very similar structure. I don't know if you've noticed this, but wherever you are in the world, whether it's in, uh, you know, Jerusalem or, I mean, Tel Aviv really to be exact, or, you know, JFK, Brazil, Thailand, Zimbabwe, all airports have a very similar structure, identical in fact. And that is that they're made up of these long hallways, right, long corridors with different gates. And the gates look identical from the outside. We have 57B, 32C, right? And looking at those gates from the outside, seeing the people standing there, you would have a close to no way of figuring out where each one of those gates would lead you to. Right? So you could quite literally have a person going to Canada, standing shoulder to shoulder with a person going to, help me out, Brazil. Brazil, thank you. So my neighbor, I have a very special neighbor back in Israel, Rabbi Tim Tarshish, uh, actually told me once that when she was bored on one of her trips, she counted, she started counting the steps separating one gate from the other. And she realized that in almost any airport out there, it's never more than 30 steps separating one gate from the next. Interesting, no? Mm -hmm. And it dawned on me that imagine, right, imagine if a person were to, you know, embark on a journey to Yerushalayim, but they would, by mistake, enter through a gate leading to Thailand, right? So nowadays that wouldn't really be possible since they check your boarding pass, but just, just humor me on this, yeah? And halfway through the flight, this person hears the, the, the you know, PA system of, hello, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to land in Thailand, please buckle your seatbelts. He's like, oh my gosh, uh, but I wanted to go to Yerushalayim. But wait, wait, wait. There are only 30 steps separating one gate from the other, right? So, not a problem. And he gets up in the aisle and walks back 30 steps. So we laugh because we realize that once you've already embarked on that journey, is it impossible to change course? Is it impossible to turn back around and redefine your destination? It's not impossible, but it takes a tremendous amount of work because you have to go back to where? To the gate. So there are certain moments in your life that are those gates at the airport moments. Moments where you're given the choice to determine the destination that you're headed towards, the, the course of the rest of your life. This moment, this stage of your life, this crossroads is one of those moments, one of those gate at the airport moments where you get to ask yourself, where am I going? So, I once heard Rabbi Arlovsky addressing a group of young men as they were about to start their, their process of dating for marriage, or as we would call it, Shaduchim, right? And he told them that before, before making sure that you're compatible with a spouse, right? Before, before choosing your life partner, the first step is to make sure that you have common goals in life. Makes sense, right? So the problem is that most people never stop to ask themselves, what their goals in life even are. Does anyone here have any goals in life? So one guy raises his hand all confidently and he says, yes, yes, in fact, I, I have a goal in life. I want to be a dentist. So the rabbi says, no, no, it's not, it's not your goal in life. Anybody else? And the guy's like, rabbi, what do you mean? You're going to tell me what my goal in life is? I, I've wanted to be a dentist since I'm a kid. My father's a dentist. My grandfather's a dentist. Dentistry is my goal in life. So the rabbi tells him, it's not your goal in life and I'll prove it to you. Okay, it's after 120, and you've passed on to bigger and better, and you get to hover around on a cloud as they're writing your eulogy, okay? And it goes a little something like this. He was a dentist. He cured many impact and molars, which everyone knows are the hardest to reach. He was able to remove plaque from the you know, bottom gums without hurting the very sensitive tissue around the, and the guy's like, ha very funny, Rabbi, I get your point. Wait, 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 I'm getting to the best part. Your tombstone is a giant tooth. <laughs> and on it it says, here lies a dentist. He just filled 
his last cavity. Oh, oh. <laughs> so the guy's like, very funny, Rabbi, I get your point, fine, then she's not my goal in life. And the rabbi's like, perfect, amazing, the first step is admitting you have a problem, so what is your goal in life? What do you mean? What do you mean? I have to choose one goal, I have so many goals. Okay, great, name one. I, how can I name one? I, I, I want to do all kinds of stuff. And we laugh. But the truth is that most of us go through life just doing all kinds of stuff. Busy doing all kinds of things that often have little or nothing to do with what our final destination really is. I want to share a very powerful concept with you. One that is probably at the root and the basis of my every decision making. And those of you, those alumni who have been part of my life for a while probably heard me say this maybe dozens of times. And that is that most people know what they want. Some people even know how they plan on getting it. But select few ever ask themselves why. Why do I want what I want? The difference between those who succeed and those who fail, those who do and those who don't, lies in that very question. In your ability to ask yourself, what's your why? What's your driving force? Tell me more about the why. There's a famous experiment, one that many of you may have heard of, that is the marshmallow experiment. Anyone mm -hmm. heard of this, right? AP Psych, right? Okay, the marshmallow experiment, there are different versions of this going around on, online. Uh, you can YouTube it after, after we finish talking if you want. Um, and what it was was a, an experiment where they took a group of children, ages, I believe it was four to six, Right? And they sat them in a room with one of those uh, double-way, two-sided mirrors and a video camera in front of a plate with one marshmallow. And they tell the kid, do you want the marshmallow? And the kid's like, yeah! And they say, wait, wait, wait! In the other room, I have a bag full of marshmallows. If you wait here and you don't eat that first one, I'll go to the other room and get you a second one. Do you want two marshmallows? Now, every kid knows the answer. What's better than one marshmallow? Two. Two marshmallows. So they're like, yeah, two marshmallows. And then they video the responses, the reactions of those kids as they're waiting for that second marshmallow to arrive. And it's fascinating to watch, right? One kid, uh, you know, kind of takes his entire chair, turns it around, and doesn't even look. Yeah, one kid is like smelling the marshmallow, and putting it down, and poking the marshmallow, and putting it down, biting the marshmallow, and putting it down. One kid, as they're explaining the experiment, is already kind of eating that first marshmallow, <laughs> right? And then they followed this group of children who I believe it was maybe over a decade. And they noticed the most incredible thing. They noticed that there was an undeniable correlation between the way they dealt with the experiment and their success later in life. Their success in sports, their success in academics, their success in relationships. Now I watched this experiment with my sister. My sister who is truth-seeking and worldly and lives a very, very different life than that of mine. And when we finished watching the experiment, we kind of both turned to each other at the same time and said, wow, what a kid. That kid was for sure the most successful one. And she said, which one, which one do you mean? I said, no, which one, which one do you mean? So she looked at me and she said, what do you mean? Obviously, it's the kid that while they were explaining the experiment was already eating the marshmallow. And she said, like this. She said, that's a kid that knows what he wants and is not afraid to go for it. That's a kid that follows his gut. That's a kid that lives in the moment. And my heart broke. Because I realized that we live in a world that begs us to settle for that first marshmallow. We live in a world that begs us not to see past the stuff we just fill our day to day with. Every kid knows the answer. What's better than one marshmallow? Two. Two marshmallows. Tell me the worries about the why. Tell me the worries about the fact that we know that whether you realize it yet or not, there's a second marshmallow out there for you that's way bigger than all this stuff. And we want to help you get there. Now, if you want to kind of bring this home, make it a bit more personal, like, Staring at you. Let's let's try to let's try to let's try to kind of uh, you know make it real, Malia, right? Is it Malia or Mali? Whichever one. What, what do you prefer? I don't care. I don't know. You don't care. Okay. 
Malia. Okay. Yeah, fine. So Malia is from exotic Brooklyn. Yeah, anyone ever heard of it? It's a, it's a small Jewish community somewhere in the, on the East Coast. Um, Malia, what's your favorite food? Is that what it is? Let's pick a food that no matter what time of day or night it is, you'll never turn it down. You just love it so much you enjoy it. Cookies? Probably, yeah. Okay, what kind of cookies? Describe it. Any. Any? Yeah. Okay, so let's pick your favorite cookie, your absolute favorite cookie. Chocolate? Is it? Okay, we'll go with that. Chocolate? Yeah, I don't have a favorite. You don't have a favorite? No, I just like all of them. Okay, so pick one. Just pick one. The world is chocolate chip. Chocolate chip. Okay, like what kind of chocolate chip? Actually, chocolate chip has many varieties. No, is it thin? Is it thick? Is it chewy? Is it crunchy? Just the soft ones. The soft chocolate chip cookies. You like the big, small, bite size? No, the big ones. The big ones. The big chocolate chip cookies. Um, and do you like the chocolate chips to be kind of spread all over or where you can notice each one? You know when they're almost not fully melted? Yeah. What kind of chocolate chips? Well, not so many. Not so many? Okay, great. So not so many, like a good cookie to chocolate chip ratio. Yeah, tell me more. Yeah. A big cookie with a good yeah. ratio. Yeah. Not like hard. Like not hard. hard. Soft chocolate chips. Okay, we're getting there. Is that is that your dream cookie? Yeah. Do you like your cookies warm, cold? No, warm. Warm. Okay, everybody's following? Yeah. So a large, soft, Warm chocolate chip cookie with a good cookie to chocolate chip ratio. Yes? Yeah. Now, Mom, you come home from school. It's a gloomy, rainy, dark day in sunny Brooklyn. And you woke up in the morning, it was dark outside, you were cold, you didn't want to go out of bed, but you made a deal with yourself that you would, and then you'd go right back to sleep. Anybody ever do that? Yeah? And you went to school, you forgot your lunch at home, you stepped in the puddle, your socks are wet, you're hungry, you're cranky, you come home and you are starving. And as you walk into your house, you're going to throw your backpack aside, you've had the worst day, you walk up into the kitchen, and on the table is a large, soft, warm, chocolate chip cookie with perfectly melted chocolate chips with your name on it at that moment how pleasurable is that cookie on a scale of one to ten it's like 11. 11. Uh -huh. 11. Yeah. who relates yeah. i relate okay now Molly, let me ask you this it's after uh, 20 22 24 years of living and you finally meet him that special someone that I know, I'm not going to tell anyone, that you've been kind of daydreaming about since you were a little girl. And from the minute you met him, you knew. He finished your sentences, he could hear your thoughts before you even heard your own thoughts. You had so much in common, he could see through your soul. And not only does he adore you, Malia, his mother adores you. <laughs> she tells you, Malia, we are so honored and lucky to have you as a future daughter-in-law that we want to fly you and 44 of your closest future friends to Israel to have your wedding, your dream wedding, on top of the David Citadel rooftop overlooking 2,000 years of Jewish history. And you're standing there in your dream dress. Shweki himself is standing in the corner staring at you. And you start walking down that aisle surrounded by your family, friends, and Shweki, right? And at that moment, as you walk down the aisle, you lock eyes with that special someone. And at that moment, everything just melts away. And all you can think of is the sense of incredible potential, the sense of, of the, the first day of the rest of your life. And at that very moment, as you're walking down towards your future, toward, towards your, the fulfillment of your potential, I quickly grab the mic away from Shweki and I say, stop! In my car, I have a warm, soft, large chocolate chip cookie with perfectly melted chocolate chips with your name on it. Molly, at that point, how pleasurable is the cookie? Not really, at all. On a scale of 1 to 10, what would you say? Like zero. Zero. Ladies, what, what happened to the cookie? Are you saying I can't make good cookies? Is that what you're saying? How did the cookie go from an 11 to a zero? So I'll tell you. And it's actually quite simple. Nothing happened to the cookie. What happened was that you were now introduced to a higher level of pleasure. You were now introduced to an ultimate level of pleasure, one that makes everything else sort of melt away. Lady Stormy Bar is about the why. It's about the fact that we recognize that there's a second marshmallow out there that's gonna 
be so much more meaningful, so much more powerful than all this stuff. It'll make everything kind of just melt away. Now how, how do we plan on getting there? That you've already found out. If we're sitting here in this room together, it's because you took the time to do your homework, your research, at least some of us. Uh, took the time to do your homework, your research, you found out about all the incredible classes and all the team limb and all the different ways in which we plan to help you get there. But again, don't get lost in the details because it's not about the how, it's about the why. And I want to tell you my personal why. My hope and my belief is that this isn't really a 10 month journey. Right? This, isn't a, this isn't an experience that starts when you get off the plane in Israel and ends when you get back on. It's a journey for at least 102 more years and possibly many more generations. And my why is that you shouldn't go on that journey alone. You're going to go on it together with each other. Whether you know that yet or not, you're going to go on it with us to support you, to cheer you on, and to really uh, be inspired by you. I'm going to give the floor to Rabbi Fix, and before I do, I want to just tell you all who here heard my voice note on the unofficial chat. Okay, good. Ooh. <laughs> okay, good. So I want to tell you all that after registration closes, we will in Ritz Hashem have an official to our chat. So fear not, that will happen. Anyone here who's concerned with not, uh, you know, securing a roommate request at this point, it is very, very premature. Do not worry about that. Um, those of you that already have my contact saved on their phone, who here has my contact saved on their phone? Yes? What? It's not Trink with an I, right? Correct? It's Trink. There's a, it's a right misconception over there. Yeah, those of you that don't have my contact saved on their phone, uh, please come over to me after and I'll give you my number or get it from each other. I'd love to have you saved on my phone so you can watch the Tom Bar status, which is on my phone, and sign up for the Tom the TV, TV, TV tidbits. It's a new, a new project that we just started. Um, and I feel incredibly, incredibly honored to welcome you to the Tomer Devar class of 2022 Wow. Okay. <laughs> sum up maybe in short, uh, just a very, very quick thought, because I know I'm um, just because. <laughs> I don't know anything, just because. <clears throat> First of all, I also want to echo um, what Mrs. Trang said with a very, very big um, Yasha Kaha. And thank you to the Weinbergs. Let's hear it. Um, the, the Weinbergs support of uh, Tom and Vora is really, um, it's touching. It's touching, it's so sweet, it's so special. Um, there are certain families that just become Tom and Vora families, and the, uh, the Weinbergs very much just became part of the Tom and Vora family. And it's um, not something that we take for granted, it's something very special, and we appreciate very, very much them opening up their home consistently, every single year, time and again, time and again. <clears throat> okay. I want to share with you guys a quick thought. I know you've been sitting for a bit. Um, just a very quick thought, five minutes, and uh, then we're going to let you mingle. I know how excited you all were about the mingling. <laughs> <laughs> that nervous laughter. <laughs> Does he even know what he's talking about? <laughs> I've done this before. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to let you guys get to that in a minute. <clears throat> I want to ask you the following question. What is unique? about this week's Parsha that we just read. We just read Parsha's Tetzave. You want to say it? Moshe's name isn't mentioned. How about, let's talk to her like, can you give us something harder? <laughs> right, how many times is the name yes mentioned? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> like, actually, I know that. <laughs> Moshe's name isn't mentioned. It is the only Parsha since Moshe is introduced to us in Chumash, that his name isn't mentioned. 
And the obvious question is, why isn't it mentioned? And there are a endless amount of answers to why his name is mentioned. I'll tell you what else is very interesting, is that it falls out every year that we read Parshas Ketzaveh, either right before or right after the York side of Moshe Rabbeinu. This past week, we celebrated Zion, or it was the York side of Moshe Rabbeinu. And every year we read Parshas Tetzava, the one Parsha that doesn't have his name, on the week of his York side. Lama. That means why. <laughs> why? What's the significance? What's the significance of that? So those are the two questions that we're posing. Fair? You can't say no. <laughs> yeah, okay. And I think that the answer lay in a pasuk at the very, very beginning of the parsha. Towards the beginning of the parsha, the pasuk says as follows: "Ve'ata Hashem is talking to Moshe Rabbeinu. Hakriv elecha es Aharon achicha ve'es banav ito mitoch bnei Yisrael lecha hanoli. You Moshe bring close to you Aaron and his sons to be the priests, to be the Kohanim." Aaron, Nadav, Aviyu, Lazari, Tamar, Bnei Aaron. And he lists off Aaron and his sons. This Pasuk represents, so to speak, the downfall of Moshe Rabbeinu while bringing Aaron and his sons, bringing them up to power for the Kuhuna. When did Moshe Rabbeinu lose his Kuhuna? Who remembers the story? Um, in the beginning, when Hashem sent him to save the Jewish people. Beautiful. Hashem comes to Moshe Rabbeinu and he says, Go save, go save the Jewish people. And Moshe says, Nah, not for me. And Hashem says, No, no, really, go. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, No, I can't. I'm not, you know, I'm not cut out for this type of thing. Oh, yeah. I have um, social anxiety. <laughs> 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 not for me, right? And then Hashem says, no, 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 I mean business. Really, you should go. And Moshe was saying, oh, no. Right? That's what he says, right? I can't. Kvad peh, kvad loshen, however you want to understand that. I can't go. And Moshe comes up with all the reasons until Hashem says, puts his foot down, so to speak, and says, you're going. And Moshe says, okay. But at that interaction, at that moment, at that time is when Hashem said to Moshe, you're not going to do it? No problem. Get somebody else. And you're going to lose your kahuna. Moshe was destined to be the Kohen Gadol. Moshe was destined to lead Klal Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael. Moshe was destined to build the base of Migdash. And you know what else? If that would have happened, that base of Migdash never would have been destroyed, so say Chazal. And Moshe missed the opportunity. Do you know why? Because he missed what he was destined to do in entirety. He got most of it, but he missed that piece. And he could have been the Kalangadol. And he could have been the leader all around. And Moshe Rabbeinu's name, why we read the Parsha, and Parsha's Ketzav are doing his yurt side, it's because we're not just mourning his physical death, but we're mourning the death of an opportunity. We're mourning the death of a missed destiny. That's why. And his name isn't mentioned because we're mourning that same thing. You missed the chance. And you know what's more, Moshe Rabbeinu? The show will go on. The partial will go on. If not you, it will still continue with ramifications. Because we all suffer, so to speak, with the destruction of the Mesa Megdash. If Moshe would have heeded the call, if he would have recognized and realized his opportunity, his destiny, what he was bound for, we would be basking in that glory still now. Him missing the opportunity has ramifications for generations and generations to come where even we still suffer from that missed call. 
How many of us shy away from our greatness? How many of us shy away from opportunities that we have that can bring out our potential? No. I can't. No, it's not. I'm not. I'm not that kind. Not for me. How many of us even know what it is that we're destined to do? We don't. And that's okay. And that's normal. But not to realize, not to recognize, and not to chase, and not to find out what that greatness that lies therein is, that's tragic. And it's not just you that suffers because you're not living your true authentic self. But it's the generations after. It's your spouse and your children. You have awesome responsibility because you're great. At Toma Devora, we are dedicated. We are committed. We are with you in chasing that greatness, figuring out what it is, how to access it, where it lay, where it doesn't lay. We are dedicated to committing, to working with you to figure out where that is. We do that in two ways. We do that, A, by making you recognize that you're part of something much greater than just yourself. Like Mrs. Trank said, we do this in a home because you're part of a family. We do this because this is something greater than you. This is something bigger than you. I remember I told my staff, I think it was last year, I said, Tomic Laura is involved into something that's, that's bigger than the parts. It's bigger than me or her or him or her. There's something going on. There's an energy, there's a buzz, there's a vibe. It's greater. You're tapped into that. And the other way we do it, which seems to be the exact opposite, is not just by tapping into you into something greater, but by honing in and focusing on the you. On the you as the individual. And your greatness could express itself in quiet ways at home. It could express itself by being out there and making a difference in the world outwardly. It doesn't matter how, but to recognize your greatness. That's what we're committed to. And now I want to do something. And I was debating if I should speak or not about this. And then I said, you know what? You know what? We keep talking about the big buzzword in Tom Vara. Who knows what it is? Yeah. Why? Good. I like that. Good. Real. Now it's real. Now it's real, authentic. Let's get real. That's it. That's my big word. Now. <laughs> but the Tom Vara word is authenticity. Let's be real. So I want to be real with you for a minute. Because okay. that could have been a nice part Torah, and I could have ended it there, and I could have said, okay, guys, let's, let's be great, yeah? Which is what we're going to do. But I want to take it one step further. I said I was going to speak a little bit about the social, like, piece of I'm getting anxious, but Mrs. Trent covered that, thank you very much, for my thunder. Again, <laughs> right? Fine. So we covered that piece, right? But I want to speak about one other little piece. You know, a lot of times, what, what's the idea of the open house? What's the idea of the open house? I do the open house is like one of our biggest frustrations when we go in the interview. So we sit with girls, and each girl says, "Well, yeah, you know, you know, you're really nice, or you know, you know, that's really nice." But who are the other girls coming? Who are the girls? There? What's the other types of girls that are going to be there? And every time we would sit there and think, our scratch our heads, being like, "How do we get you all into a room together? How do we get you into a room together and just see for yourself?" You know what I mean? So this represents a small group, a nice group, a great group, a small group, or 40, 45, 50 girls, whatever it is, over here, you know, and there's, but, so you start to get a sample, you start to get a taste. But let's be real and let's be honest. Sometimes, and tell me if this isn't true, in the process of, of um, deciding or acceptances or deciding, you look around and you know other girls, a lot of girls know other girls from other schools, from the same school, and you start to think to yourself, oh, well, you know, Tell me if you don't do this, or if, at least you don't think, well, not us here in Tom Tora. But let's say other girls do this. Well, if it's for her, then it's not for me. You familiar with that? Right? Oh, well, oh, if she's going, it can't be that it's the right thing. Oh, no, we're not exactly the same type. Oh, we're not exactly the same. Oh, we're not the same, you know, jive. It's not, right? 
And the answer to that is, is that you're missing something fundamental. We often dress ourselves up. We dress ourselves up. And we take on certain characters that we play. We play certain characters or we act in certain ways that don't always represent the deepest desires of who we are. And I want to tell you something. Every single girl that's sitting in this room that was accepted into Tomer Devara, and not just the ones sitting here, the ones that were accepted that couldn't make it here, expressed either to myself or to Mrs. Trank during the interview, or when we spoke to your administrators or to your staff or whatever it was we did, a deep, deep desire for greatness a deep desire to want to know more, to know deeper, to know better, to tap in, to feel connected, to lead an authentic life. Every single one of you. And if there's one of them you're saying, well, how could it be what she's done? You're mistaken. There is depth in this room, and there is depth beyond, that I could take any two random girls, any two, sit down in the office for more than five minutes and each one of you would walk out of here guaranteed saying to me that girl she's got that and we tap into it by challenging you academically intellectually socially emotionally religiously spiritually in every which way but ultimately what happens is we create an environment, we create a culture of a growth-oriented environment. Growth, exciting, happy, fun, a lot of fun, (laughs) a lot of fun. Fun, but one that taps into your unique abilities and greatness so that your authentic selves thrive and come out. And once you do that, we create that type of community, that type of society. When you lead that lifestyle, that also affects generations and generations and generations Matova for the good. Until ultimately we create a society that we build this authenticity where Tom Dvor goes beyond just the you and me and it ripples and ripples and ripples and ripples until we reach a status and a state when we dive for Mashiach, what are we diving for? We're adopting for a state of being where all of us are tapped into our authentic selves. I believe deeply that that's something that happens in Tom and Mara. So with that, I challenge you to join and tap into the greatness that we know that every single one of you possess. Have a nice day. <laughs>